So good to see you today. How many of you glad to be in church this morning? Amen. It's good to be together today. We thank God for what he's doing in our lives. Amen. I want to invite you to open with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6, uh, John chapter 8 rather, John chapter 8. That's where we're going to start this morning and then Genesis chapter 1 as well. So John chapter 8 and Genesis chapter 1. Of course, I want to invite everybody out tonight. We have church tonight at 6 p.m. We're going to have a wonderful time together. Everybody's welcome. Everyone's invited. Kids are welcome too. And we're almost finished with our series going through Hebrews chapter 11. And tonight we're going to be looking about having faith in the hard times. How I many you know that faith isn't just for when things are going great? But sometimes we need faith in when things aren't going so great. And so tonight we're going to learn that uh, God can sustain us through our faith, even in the hard times. So I encourage you to come on out tonight. I know you will be blessed by that. Uh, also, this morning, I just want to give a little bit of a warning uh, for the parents here today. Uh, we're in a series. If, if you're new here today, we're glad that you're here today. Uh, but we're in a series right now where we're going through looking at uh, some of the difficult issues that our culture is going through right now. And uh, today's message is, is definitely going to contain uh, some adult content, and uh, we're going to be looking at the T, what the Bible says about the T in the LGBTQIA2S plus um, an acronym. So if, if, if parents, if, if that's something that you're not ready for your children to, to hear about, and I understand that completely. We have a wonderful children's ministry uh, up at the top of our hill in the chapel, and uh, you could take your uh, kids up there, and they'll have a wonderful time there today. So uh, that is my disclaimer this morning, and so let's jump in. We're going to jump into John chapter 8 today, and we're going to start in verse 31. I would encourage you to go and read this whole passage on your own, this whole chapter of John chapter 8, but we're going to look at specifically... Uh, verses 31 through 47 this morning. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And, I will, I, and, and you, if you do that, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many of you, that's your testimony today, that the truth of Christ and the gospel has set you free today? Amen. They answered him. They said, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say that you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we are not of illegitimate birth. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me because I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. 
He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he is speaking out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you can convict me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Father, we thank you for your word. It is, as the scripture declares, a a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, though the world would try through lies and deceit to confuse, to, to, to make unclear what you have made clear to to try and darken our path. Lord, your word shines brighter than the power of a thousand suns, making things clear that the world tries to confuse, making things obvious that in the world are completely in darkness. Lord, as we spend time in your word today, I pray that the power of your truth would set us free from the lies and the deceit and the deception that you said come from Satan himself. Let us not be bound by lies, but let us be set free by your truth, the truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As Christians, those of us who claim to follow Christ, we have a fundamental commitment to the truth. To the truth. Though we live in a world today that says there's no such thing as objective truth, as absolute truth, though we live in a world that says everything is relative, we live in a postmodern society that says even if there was truth, we could never know it or discern it for ourselves. The Word of God tells us clearly and plainly that it itself is self-attesting and the truth, and that Jesus himself is the full embodiment of the truth, as he declared that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus said that he is the one who has brought the truth from heaven to earth, that he has declared it to us from the mouth of God, that those of us who listen to him, believe in him, and follow him, that we walk in the truth. And so as Christians, we we are not... uh, it's not an option for us to, to have a, 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 a interesting relationship with the truth. No, we have to fully embrace it. What is, the, what is true, we fully embrace, and what is not, we fully reject. The truth is Christ, and he, the truth, sets us free. Now, Jesus says here that Satan, in verse 44, is a liar and the father of lies. So everything that is not true does not come from God, but rather comes from Satan himself, the father of lies. Where does falsehood come from? Where does confusion come from? Not from God. God is not the author of confusion. Confusion, lies, and deceit come from Satan, who is the father of lies. And if truth is the way to God, which Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the father but through me, So following the truth, believing upon the truth, which is Christ, is the way to be reconciled to God. The opposite is also true. If following the truth leads us to God, then the road to hell is paved with lies. Following lies leads you to hell. So as Christians, we love the truth. We want the truth. We desire to know the truth even if it hurts. Have you ever been told the truth that hurt you? You didn't want to hear the truth, but it helped you, it healed you, right? The the, the things that, that sometimes people can see about us that we can't see ourselves, those character flaws, those defects. I've been told in my life some very hard truths that was not pleasant to hear, but in the end brought healing to my soul. As Christians, that's what we are after because nothing good comes from believing lies and deceit. 
And so what I've tried to do over the course of this series, week after week, is to show you that all of the issues that plague our society, they're not many different issues. They're not separate issues. There's one fundamental issue underlying all of them, and it is lies and deception. That all the issues that we've been talking about spring forth from lies, deceit, and at their fountainhead they have Satan, the father of lies. So we looked at the lie of autonomy, believing that we are outside of God or not under God's rule and reign. We looked at the lie of neutrality, that we are somehow, can be somehow spiritually neutral. No, we are either part of God's family, as he says, or we're the offspring of Satan, part of his family. There's two families. We're part of one or the other. There's no neutrality with anyone. We looked at the lie of origins that's in our culture today, so prevalent that we weren't created by God, but that we all just are some of this happy accident that exploded and time and chance and matter and poof, here we are. No, that's a lie. We are created by God. We have God as our creator. We looked at the lies that underline the issue of abortion. We looked at, and, and what we've done is we've, we've applied the truth of God's word to all of these issues. All of the issues in our world, they spring forth from lies. And so while the Bible may not specifically address every single issue that we might see in the culture today by name, it does fundamentally address the root cause of every single one of those issues. And we need to take what the word of God says and apply it to all of life. Which brings us to our topic today, looking at transgenderism. Now today I want to talk specifically to three different groups of people. I'm going to try to do it all at the same time. Parents, I want to address you. You need to know what is happening in the world that your kids are living in. You need to know, especially parents of teenagers and children. We need to wake up as parents to what is happening in the world our kids are living in. The second group of people I want to address are people who who may be confused today about your gender or your sexuality. And I want to speak to you and, and I want to share with you God's plan for you, God's purpose for you, God's design for you, to try to to bring clarity where there's confusion today. And then number three, I want to speak to all of us who follow Christ and 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 what does it look like to be faithful to Christ about this issue? Maybe you know somebody that's that's going through a gender transition right now, or they've declared that they're uh, a uh, a transgender. What what do we do? How do we respond as Christians? I want to address that today. So today, what, what is transgenderism? Maybe you're here and you showed up from Mars today and you have never heard this term. Let's... Let's establish some terms today so we actually know what we're talking about. Transgenderism is a subset of what is called gender theory or queer theory. Those aren't the same things, but sometimes they are lumped together as the same thing. But it's a subset of of this gender theory or queer theory. And this theory teaches that gender, male and female, is a socially constructed idea. Gender theory Queer theory teaches that that gender has nothing to do with biological sex. It's all a social construct. It's all something that somebody invented one day. Therefore, as the theory states, someone can be born in the body of a woman, but on the inside they can have the gender of a man. And vice versa, the theory teaches that you can be born in the body of a biological male, But on the inside, your true self, you're really a woman. But not only that, it it not only teaches that, but it, it also teaches that gender is not binary. That gender is not either male or female, man or woman, but rather that gender is a is a spectrum. So it's not one or the other. You have male on one end of the spectrum and female on the other end of the spectrum. And you may be male and you may be female, but you you may be somewhere in between on this spectrum between the genders. And so gender as a spectrum or a continuum, 
You, you might be male, you might be a man, or it might be a woman, or, or you might be something in between. So you might be a man born in a woman's body, according to the theory, but you can also be non-binary. So again, binary is male and female, but you could be something else. And this leads to these different identities, uh, gender identities, of which today there are 72 recognized gender identities. Transgender is one of them, but it's also non-binary, non-gender conforming, gender queer, gender fluid. You're somewhere here in this spectrum of the 72 genders. But you need to make sure that you don't confuse gender identity with sexual identity. Those are also different things. Sexual identity has nothing to do with gender. Sexual identity has to do with what kind of person you're attracted to sexually. So heterosexual, homosexual, gay, lesbian, bi, queer, these are sexual identities, but it's not limited to those things either. In fact, there are 47 sexual identities, which include things like androgynous, polyamorous, polysexual, omnisexual, demisexual, pansexual, and again, 46 others of these. You, you understand this, you get the point. Are you confused yet? If, if you are, you're not alone. So that's gender theory, that's queer theory. What does the Bible have to say about all of this? Well, unsurprisingly, the Bible is abundantly clear. Unsurprisingly, while the world has come up with these theories that are so confusing, that, are, that, that overlap and, and contradict and conflict with each other, oftentimes the Bible offers a vision of gender and sexuality that is abundantly clear and not confusing at all at any point and never conflicts with each other at all. And so now let's go to Genesis chapter 1. I think I've read from Genesis chapter 1 the last six weeks, but here we are again. And the, the fundamental issue, again, it springs back to, is God the creator? And if God is the creator, which he is, does he not define his creation? Yes, he does. And so Genesis chapter one declares that God is the creator, that he spoke the universe into existence, that he doesn't live inside of creation, but he exists outside of time and space and creation and the universe itself. Verse 26 of Genesis chapter one, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them. So when he says man, man there, he's speaking of mankind, humanity. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, and over the livestock, and over, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You were created in the image of God. Every single one of you. Every single living, breathing thing in here. I don't think we have any service animals in here today. You are all created in the image and likeness of God Almighty. That means you have consciousness, you, you have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a mind, and you were created to know God, to be in relationship with God, to live out for the glory of God, that through your life, the glory of God would be put on display to all the world and to all humanity. You were created in his image to glorify him. Verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, Male and female, he created them. This is the vision that God has for sexuality. This is how God created the world, male and female. Not transgender, not gender queer, not gender fluid, not gender non-conforming, not non-binary. God created humanity binary, male and female. This is God's design. This is God's creation. And God blesses this. 28, he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God's design for humanity is that we would live in monogamous, heterosexual, 
marriage relationships that result in children being born, image bearers of God being born, who grow up, who love God, who worship God, and fill the earth with his glory. That's God's desire for humanity. Now, Satan hates humanity because humanity is in the image of God. And so Satan is actively working to destroy humanity. We see in Genesis chapter 2, where God, it gives us a, a, a detailed account of how God created man and woman. That he created the man first and gave him a task which showed him his need for a companion, which showed Adam his need for a mate. And so once Adam recognized his need, that he was all alone, God caused a deep sleep to fall upon him. And he took from Adam one of his ribs and he formed Eve out of one of his ribs. And when Adam saw Eve, he said, whoa, man. Yeah, exactly. His, his jaw dropped and he said, yes, this is at last bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then God declares, therefore, and we say this at the end of every wedding, Therefore, what a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 19, quotes from this passage and says, What God has joined together, let not man separate. This is God's design, and it is good, and it is wonderful, and it results in human flourishing. When children are birthed into the world, and, and they are raised to love and serve God, and the husband loves and serves God and serves his wife, and the wife respects and submits to her husband in love as unto the Lord, and the children obey the parents in the Lord because this is right, it results in societies and cultures and nations and the blessing of God going to all the world. And as soon as you start to destroy this, you don't have the blessing of God anymore. As soon as you start to destroy this, the society begins to fracture and begins to fall apart. And so Satan knows this. Satan hates humanity because we show, we, everywhere we go, we preach that God is the creator and that God is sovereign over all things. Gender, sexuality, these are not part of a cultural construct. These are a God construct. Sex and gender are not two different ideas. There are two sexes. There are two genders. It is male and female. It is man and woman. Gender is not determined by some inward feeling of maleness or womanness. No, gender is determined by biology. At the level of biology, it is science. Gender is science. It's the chromosomes that come together. From the moment of conception, your gender and sexuality are determined from the moment of conception, the very moment. If you are a male, you have an XY chromosome. If you are a female, you have XX chromosome. And every single cell in your body carries this information. Every single cell. From the moment of conception, every cell in your body will carry either XX or XY chromosome. God is the one who chooses your sex. It's not some, gen, it's not some social construct put upon you. It's, it's science, it's biology, and I think it's so amazing that the people who claim so vehemently, we believe in science, I believe in science, that they, they're the ones who adopt this queer ideology, which is the most anti-scientific idea in the world. It denies reality. It denies the truth. 
Psalm 139, 13 says that God forms our inward parts and that he knit each one of us together in our mother's womb. That God is the one who wove us together, knit us together, that he is the creator, the master creator, and formed and fashioned each one of us in our mother's womb. God is the one who determined our sex way before we were born. In eternity past, before he even spoke the worlds into existence, God knew what our sex would be. And men and women are different by God's design. We're different, both equal and created in the image of God, but different. And women are not in any way lesser or inferior to men. Womanhood is a beautiful thing, part of God's good design. The Bible says that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God's very spirit resides within our bodies. Biological sex is not something that is assigned at birth. You'll hear that over and over and over and over again in these trans communities, in, in this ideology. Well, the doctor assigned to me that I was a man at birth, but I'm really a, a woman. The doctor didn't assign your gender at birth. He observed your gender at birth. Him along with everybody else in the room. God is the one who assigned your gender, not the doctor. And these distinctions that God has made between man and woman, he, he loves them. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. They're not meant to be erased, but they're meant to be celebrated. In fact, when God gives his law to the children of Israel, his chosen people, as they're heading into the promised land in the book of Deuteronomy, God says it's an abomination for a man to dress like a woman. And it's an abomination for a woman to dress like a man because it destroys the, the unique differences and distinctions that God has foreordained. And so, since the Bible is so clear that there's only two genders, two sexualities, where, where does this explosion of gender ideology come from? And I want to give you some of the history of this idea, this thought, this philosophy, this theory, because it's important to know where ideas come from. It's really important. When we talked about abortion, we, we talked about uh, the, the lady that uh, began Planned Parenthood and, and her, her racist past and her eugenicist past. We, we talked about her war on humanity. And likewise, we need to understand that this gender ideology doesn't come from good, wholesome sources. There's three figureheads that serve as the sort of the, the really the, the fountainhead at the, at the beginning of these uh, gender confusion, gender theory uh, waters. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. I will give you their names in case you want to research uh, some of them on your own. But they are Alfred Kinsey, the Frenchman named Michel Foucault, and then a man named John Money. Alfred Kinsey, Michel Foucault, and John Money. These three scientists, doctors by title, <laughs> used science as a cloak for their own dark sexual perversions. They would observe and, and have people engage in every form of perverse sexual practice and often engaging with their subjects themselves, observing it, documenting it, and calling it scientific research. All three of these men today are heralded as acclaimed doctors by modern academia, and they're lauded as revolutionaries. They're praised as sexual liberators. Today, they're held in high esteem in colleges and universities across the United States of America. Now, all three of these men were 
staunch advocates for every single form of sexual expression imaginable, including sex with children, which they, some of them called a healthy thing. In fact, uh, one of them was such an advocate for this that he encouraged parents to engage in sexual behavior with their own children. That children themselves are sexual beings. All of them were advocates for pedophilia and all of them practiced it. Foucault would take young boys as young as eight at night to cemeteries where he would abuse them on the gravestones of the dead. John Money, the third in the list, is really who's credited with what is known specifically as gender ideology and queer theory. It's his theory that gender is a social construct that's thrust upon us throughout our lifetimes, but that we are born genderless. John Money convinced a family that had two twin boys to raise one of their boys as a girl. One of their children, a boy named Bruce, had sustained a very serious injury while he was being circumcised. His, his body part was mangled. And so John Money prevailed upon the family, the parents, to fully remove his genitalia and raise him as a girl. And so Bruce, this little boy at nine months old, was, went through a gender reassignment surgery his name was changed to Brenda, and his family raised him as a girl, never telling him his true identity through childhood. This little boy named Bruce battled severe depression his whole life. He, he never took on this identity. He struggled with it all throughout uh, childhood. He began to rebel against his parents at a very in a very serious way as John Money would even abuse these kids throughout their lifetime when they would meet with him. Finally, his parents revealed to him as a teenager what had really happened. And so he took on the name of David, immediately rejecting his female identity and lived the rest of his life as a man, going through surgeries to try and reconstruct what had been taken from him. You can see him tell his own story he did an Oprah interview in the year 2000, you can watch that online, where he talked about the severe trauma that this caused him and that was inflicted upon him in the name of medicine and research and science by John Money. In 2004, at the age of 38, he took his own life. His brother, his twin brother, also died by his own hand of a drug overdose. Despite the abject failure of this experiment, John Money declared it was a grand success, and thousands of children have gone through gender reassignment surgeries as a result of this very incident. It's John Money's literature on gender identity that today serves as the foundation of the modern transgender movement. Now, you need to understand I am not anti doctor, I am not anti science. I thank the Lord for doctors. Every doctor and physician I've ever known has been nothing but a blessing to me. I love my doctor. I look forward to our annual visit. She takes really good care of me. I have a cardiologist. He takes really good care of me. I thank the Lord for doctors and legitimate medicine. Amen. So I'm not saying that we reject all doctors, that we reject science, that we reject medicine. But what I am saying is that simply because someone has a DR or an MD before or after their name, it doesn't make them the final authority in our lives. God's word is the final and absolute authority. There's a standard and a law that is above the doctor. And so anytime the doctor or anyone for that matter begins to prescribe some sort of course of action or ideology that conflicts with the clear word of God, we say, well, we obey God rather than man. We follow Christ and his word. And we know from history that just because someone has reached a certain level of academic success, it doesn't make them inherently good. You need only look to the... the, the concentration camps, the, the medical experiments of Auschwitz to know that just because you're a doctor doesn't mean that you are virtuous. 
And so the fountainhead of these transgender waters, this transgender movement, what sits there? Three pedophiles, Kinsey, Foucault, and Money, who abused children, who used scientific research to cloak their own sexual depravity. And now through their works and writings, millions of children all across our country are being led down a dark and twisted existence. Now, I am not denying in any way that there are some people who experience what's called a gender dysphoria, this, this genuine discomfort in their own body. I'm not discounting that. And if you're here today and you say, I experienced that, listen, I, I want you to know that that is not God's design for you to feel that way. But you also need to know where this comes from. Where these ideas that you are adopting and believing, where they come from. If you're a parent today and your kid is, is, is being led down this pathway, you need to know where this idea comes from. It comes straight from the pit of hell. Historically, those who had gender dysphoria, had this condition, discomfort with their own bodies, historically it was young boys, young boys. And it was dot zero one percent of the population. Infinitesimately small amount of people. And the vast majority of these people, the vast majority simply outgrew gender dysphoria as they aged and moved into adulthood. What this means is that, the, 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 that up until about 10 years ago, the vast majority of people would never even meet somebody that was transgender or struggling with gender identity their entire lives. Before 2012, there was no scientific literature on girls ages 11 to 21, ever having ge developed gender dysphoria at all. But today, it's teenage girls who represent the vast majority of those who identify as transgender. Prior to 2012, not a single documented case of a teenage girl developing gender dysphoria ever in the history of the world. Today, over 70% of people who are transgender become transgender as a teenage girl between the ages of 11 and 21. In fact, it's common today to find an entire peer group of friends who suddenly all discover together at the same time that they are transgender. And they be begin begging for these life-altering treatments, these puberty blockers, these testosterone uh, injections, these gender reassignment surgeries. So that today, young females now account for 70% of sex change surgeries, which people wrongfully call gender-affirming surgeries, gender-affirming care. It's not gender-affirming in any way. It's actually destroying, not affirming. It's, it's very common for these things in our culture that are so blatantly anti-Christ, anti-God, lies of the enemy to be labeled as something good. Gender affirming sounds pretty good. If you take your little boy that's struggling with his gender identity and you take him to a doctor who's going to give him gender affirming care, it sounds like they're going to help him be comfortable as a little boy. But really what they're going to help him do is to grow up to be a woman when he's an adult, if they're uh, uh, giving gender affirming care, which they also claim is life saving care. So why is this happening? Well, why is this exploding? Why is it up until 10 years ago, none of us had even heard of this, but now it's everywhere. What, what is causing this? Well, there's three or four different things I want to show you. The first one is a spiritual cause. 
The spiritual cause that's in, in our world today. And the spiritual cause is because we live in a culture that has declared war on the truth. We live in a culture that has objectively declared war on reality itself. There is no truth. There is no absolute truth. Because we've ejected absolute truth, what is left is everyone else's relative subjective experience. And so that reigns supreme. And so if you declare that you're a woman, it doesn't matter. If you say it, you are. That's what a woman is, whoever says they're a woman. There, there's no objective reality. There's no uh, absolute truth. It, it's whatever everybody else feels in their own heart. Who am I to say if you are a man or a woman? You decide that for yourself. But again, this war on the truth is a war on Christ. He is the truth. This war has a specific object, object of attack. It's Christ, his kingdom. It's Jesus reigning. Remember Psalm 2? Let us break their bonds apart, that the world is trying to, to unshackle themselves from God the creator, and he who sits in the heavens laughs. It is impossible. This rejection of absolute truth is a rejection of Christ. Colossians 1.17 says that in Christ all things hold together. So as you eject Christ from the picture, reality itself will begin to collapse. Everything begins to disintegrate, disintegrate around us because Christ has been removed. All things hold together in him. And there's many well-meaning, good-hearted, sincere Christians who haven't been savvy enough to recognize what's happening as a spiritual attack. It is a Trojan horse. It's disguised as medicine. It's disguised as science. And we don't want to be anti-science. We don't want to be anti-Christian. These people are experts. I'm just some uneducated rube. So they say there's 47 uh, genders. Well, I guess there's 47 genders. It's a Trojan horse, a war on the truth, an attack on Christ himself. That's the first reason. It is a spiritual reason. The second reason is a practical reason. In 2010, Congress passed the Affordable Care Act. The president signed it into law. And this bill made it illegal for insurance companies to deny coverage based on gender identity. So up until 2010, an insurance company could look at a 13-year-old girl who has a note from her doctor that says she needs to have her breasts removed, and the insurance company would say, we're not paying for that. But in 2010, the Affordable Care Act now says that if you offer a treatment to any group, you have to offer it to every group. So if you an insurance company will cover a woman who has breast cancer, who goes in and has a double mastectomy. They also have to provide for and pay for that surgery for any young girl who says, actually, I'm a man and I have to have my breast removed. It's a medical condition that I have. They're not allowed to discriminate on the basis of gender identity. And so now what used to be very expensive is now almost totally free. So now young girls can be given puberty blockers. So they do not develop their breasts. They do not develop, uh, never, never uh, developing a, a cycle. They, 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 their, their internal organs become atrophied to the point where they can never give birth. They're, they're given testosterone injections so they can develop the secondary characteristics of a man, a beard, a, a square jaw, uh, an increased muscle mass. And then they can receive these surgeries, all paid for, often subsidized by our own tax dollars. That's the second reason. Another practical reason, number three, that this is happening is that activists over the last 20 years have waged a very sex, uh, a successful campaign to have gender and queer theory taught in public schools. Many of these activists uh, are trained in 
uh, John Money's specific ideology. And so kids in public schools are undergoing an indoctrination, many of them starting at kindergarten, being bombarded by this propaganda. So kids are, are taught when they come into kindergarten today in many public schools across this nation, are you a boy or a girl? What are your pronouns? Do you feel like a boy today or do you feel like a girl today? You can pick which one. Are you, which, where do you fall on the spectrum? They use these cute little uh, object lessons like they have this one thing called a gingerbread man. Where they teach kids about, indoctrinate them with this propaganda. They ask teenagers, are you uncomfortable in your body? If you're uncomfortable in your body, that means that you're transgender. No, teenager, if you're uncomfortable in your body, it means you're going through puberty. That's called puberty. Everybody goes through that. The, the awkward stages, the ro ro uh, raging hormones, the things that start popping out that you to not pop out and <laughs> reacting to other things. Like, it's uncomfortable, it's weird, it's bizarre, but everybody goes through it. It's, it's part of God's design. Kids ask to place themselves on the gender spectrum. Little kids as early as five and six, do you feel like a boy? Do you feel like a girl? Maybe you're a girl. One of the things kids are taught is that if they don't like the sound of their own voice on a recording, that definitely means you're transgender. Because it means you should either have a lower voice and we'll give you testosterone, or you should have a higher voice, we'll give you estrogen. I've never met anybody who liked the sound of their own voice on a recording. So either that means that we're all transgender or that they're lying, that they're taking something that, that belongs to the natural human experience of everyone and then applying it to all kids to confuse them. The third practical reason, so we have the Affordable Care Act, we have these activists that have infiltrated the public school systems. The third is the explosion of social media that came because of smartphones. The iPhone was released in 2007. It's this little thing. Today's kids report a greater sense of loneliness than any previous generation. The levels of anxiety and depression has skyrocketed. Kids with clinical depression grew by 37% between the ages of 2005 and 2014. 90% of teens have, 95% of teens have a smartphone and are online almost constantly. Teens today spend up to nine hours a day consuming social media, on the internet, browsing it all alone, without any supervision, without any guidance. The average age that a child today is exposed to pornography is 11 years of age. And much of what is put out in pornography today is incredibly violent incredibly abusive, ha has nothing to do with portraying God's design for sex. It's all kink. It's all depraved. It's all twisted. And so young kids, especially young girls, exposed to this violent, abusive pornography at age 11 begin to see their bodies changing, and they say, I don't want that. I want nothing to do with that. And do everything they can to stop from becoming the beautiful woman that God designed them to become. On social media today, 
There are these online influencers, transgender influencers, who will actively coach kids and teenagers on how to transition, extolling the virtues of transitioning and being transgender. And so today, most girls that declare they're transgender do so after a prolonged period of social media exposure. These influencers teach kids to lie to their parents and doctors, teaching them the lies to tell them that will get them the puberty blockers, testosterone, and gender reassignment surgeries. They lie to the kids and they tell them, if you don't get these surgeries and these hormones, you will kill yourself. So you have to do whatever it takes to get them because if you don't, you're gonna kill yourself. And so they justify telling their parents, I've always known I was different, I've always been trans. They'll tell kids where to go, what doctors they can go to uh, that will not tell their parents that they're being treated for this. You can look up online the the the, the, what, what states, what doctors, so, so kids are traveling across state lines to go visit with doctors and never telling their parents. Parents, we have to be aware of what's going on with our kids. We, we cannot ever allow our children to use the internet unsupervised. And so what we're seeing today is a social contagion not a medical disorder. This is, this is something that's being spread through thoughts and ideas, not a genuine medical problem. In 2007, there was one gender clinic that would help kids make this transition. Today, there are 70 of these clinics in the United States. Girls as young as 13 are being recommended for double mastectomies. Imagine if we treated people with anorexia like this. You go to, to a doctor, doctor, I'm fat. He says, you're 90 pounds. No, no, you don't understand. I identify as fat. Oh, I see. You are fat. Look at how fat you are. Here, let me give you some diet pills. It's insanity. Instead of the medical community helping kids to understand What's going on, they're affirming them in this social contagion. And so sex change surgeries in 2020 was a $300 million industry. And it's increasing at a rapid rate. By the end of the decade, it will be a billion dollar industry in the United States. So today, 40% of Gen Z ages who, who were born 97 to 2012, 40% of Gen Z identify as LGBT, 40%. Many colleges today report that 50% of incoming freshmen are LGBT. Parents, we gotta wake up. So these four components, what are they? I believe it's detached parents who allow their children unfettered, unrestricted, unsupervised access to the internet. If you're doing that, you're, you're, you're throwing your children to the wolves. You're throwing your children to the wolves. I believe that teenagers shouldn't even have one of these. I know that makes me Amish. <laughs> teenagers, I'm wrecking your life right now. Actually, I'm trying to save your life. My kids need a phone. Listen, get them a dumb phone, all right? All my friends have, all, you know, the, the, your kids are going to beg. Mine are begging. Your kids are going to call you a bad parent. They're going to call you unfair. They're going to say all these things about you. Parents, guess what? God didn't put you in their life to be their best friend. He put you in their life to protect them, to train them, to raise them in the ways of God. Well, that's just how kids socialize today. That kids congregate, you know, we used to go to the mall, but the malls are closing down. They don't, don't go to the mall anymore. They just all get on social media today. Listen, if, if kids today were socializing, at, you know, at, at, a, at, a, at a strip club, well, that's where kids socialize today. So I guess I gotta let my kids go there. No, 
It's dangerous. And I would submit to you, parent, that you don't even know how to use this thing. That you don't even know how to control yourself. That you are addicted to this. That you have an unhealthy relationship with this. That this has changed you in a fundamental way that you don't even understand. And so how in the world, if you can't even manage how much time you spend on Facebook and playing Candy Crush, do you think, do you think that an 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old is going to be able to handle it? Parents, we have to be engaged. So detached parents, the state, the state school system that indoctrinates kids in LGBT propaganda, online influencers that are deceiving and coaching kids how to transition, and this medical establishment for profit. Doctors that are doing this for the money. And there is a lot of money to be made. In, in, in getting ready for this over the last few weeks, I've been spending time researching what it's really like, what people really go through who medically transition. And I cannot even begin to tell you about the horror stories of these transition surgeries. Because as it turns out, women are made to be women and men are made to be men. And no matter, no matter what any doctor tells you, he, woman, girl, he cannot make you into a man. I don't care what he cuts off and what he tries to sew on, you will never be a man. Men, you will never be a woman. Whatever you cut off and whatever you insert, it does not make you a woman. I don't care if the President of the United States calls you a woman, you are not a woman. The doctors that are pushing this are doing so for their own financial gain. But the, these, the, the stories of these people that suffer at the hands of these so-called doctors will make you sick to your stomach. It is absolutely barbaric. The failure rate is insane. You'll read stories about body parts rotting off of, of leftover flaps of skin that, that just are just there and just in the way of everything. People losing all function of their ability to urinate where now they have to walk around with, with no visible markers of any sort of gender because it all fails so they all have to come off and they just are strapped to a catheter and a urine bag for the rest of their life at 18 years of age. Robbing young girls of their ability to ever be a mother, to ever reproduce. What is all of this? It is a war on humanity. It is a war on God's image bearers. It's what Satan has been up to since the garden. It is using quote unquote science and technology since they have now advanced to the point where we think ourselves God. And so now we play God. Where God used to be the one that assigned sex, now we assign sex. But it is far from it. Rather than using science for good, we're using it for evil in new and novel and experimental ways and we're experimenting on little kids playing God and declaring our autonomy from God. If the enemy can't kill children in the womb, he will attack them and sterilize them outside the womb, robbing them of their fertility so that they can never reproduce image bearers of God or ever enter into that one flesh relationship that God has blessed in marriage. Abortion destroys what God is making in the womb. Transgenderism destroys what God has made outside of the womb. Transgenderism is a mental condition. It is a mental illness. It is a mental sickness. Gender dysphoria is a mental sickness. If somebody feels like they're in the wrong body, there's not anything wrong with their body. There's something wrong with their soul, with their mind, their will, their emotions, their thoughts. The solution is not to carve up their body. The solution is to heal their soul. I don't deny that those who 
have gender confusion. I don't deny that those who would even call themselves transgender, I don't deny that they are in great anguish or emotional pain. Many of them have, are, were already clinically diagnosed before they came out as trans as having severe anxiety and depression. I, I know that those things are real, that those feelings are real. I myself have walked through deep and dark valleys of anxiety and depression. Those things are real, and I'm not discounting the feelings of anybody. But the answer for me was to not put on a dress and cut off parts of my body. But if I was 15 years of age today and I went and saw a school counselor, the chances are very high that that is what they would recommend that I do. The solution is Christ. He is the one who was pierced. He is the one who was beaten. He is the one who bled for our transgressions. He is the one who is the truth, who will set us free from the lies, who will make us whole, who will bring the joy of the Holy Spirit to our lives. What the transgender influencers promise you, only Christ can give you. The joy, the peace, the contentment of the Holy Spirit. Today, in the name of trans-inclusivity, womanhood is being destroyed. Today, mothers are not called mothers anymore. They're called pregnant people or birthing people. Or you'll like this, ladies, menstruating people. How's that a nice way to call you? In our government's literature, that's what they call women today. They've remade, renamed the female anatomy the front hole. Women today are called breeders and bleeders. Isn't that dignified? It is a war on womanhood today. They claim this is more inclusive to, you know, those men who have a menstrual cycle. To those men who give birth. We don't want to offend those, those, all those men out there who, who nurse children. So we call them birthing people. What this has done for young women is turned womanhood from something to be admired, something to be desired to grow into, into something that has been shunned. Who wants to be a bleeder and a breeder? Nobody. But yet, that's what little, ki little girls are taught that women are. So again, it should be no surprise to us to find that the largest demographic of those who self-identify as transgender are teenage girls, the vast majority. It is an attack on women. It is an attack on reproduction. It's designed to rob your unique and God-given beauty and femininity. Gender theory holds up the most two-dimensional versions of men and women. You know, if you're a man, you're a, 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 a jock and a football player, and you eat pork rinds and scratch and drink beer and yell at the TV. That's what a man is. Or you're, if you're not Barbie, you're not a woman. You know, this hyper-feminized, insane version of a woman. They hold up the most ridiculous stereotypes and then they categorize men and women that way. They don't ever reflect reality. They don't ever fit. Nobody ever fits into these ridiculous stereotypical molds. And then if you don't fit into them, they declare, well, you're not a woman. Well, then that means you're not a man. It's nonsense. Amen. Though men and women are different, there's great diversity in men and women. There are men who love the arts. They love music. Amen. All right? They, they love Going to the opera, God bless you. It doesn't mean you're a woman. It means you're a man who likes the arts. There are women who excel at math and science. God's gifted you a brilliant mind. It doesn't mean that you're a man in a woman's body. It means you're a woman who excels at math and science. 
There are some women who enjoy sports. It doesn't mean that you're a man in a woman's body. It simply means you enjoy sports. You should have seen my grandma Hale yell at the Cowboys on Thanksgiving Day. I mean, I've never seen a woman more in love with sports than my grandma Hale. She loved her Cowboys, but she was all woman. This gender ideology is insanity. And so as Christians, finally as Christians, how do we respond? Well, as Christians, we stand with and for the truth. And the truth is that biological sex and gender are not two different things, but the very same thing. There are two sexes, there are two genders, male and female. This is God's good design. We stand with the truth. And this also means that we cannot tell lies. That I cannot call someone a him when he is a her. Because that is lying and all lies come from Satan who is the father of lies. So if I call a her a him, I'm speaking the lies of Satan. I'm affirming someone in their path to destruction. We have to be clear about what this is. Calling Jane John is not affirming them, it is damning them. It is a lie. And Christians, we cannot participate in this. So if your nephew shows up to Thanksgiving as your niece, you need to love them. You need to pour out love on them. You need to pull them aside. You need to talk with them. You you need to help them. You need to show them God's plan, God's design. I'm not doubting that there's pain. I'm not doubting that there's hurt. If your niece shows up as your nephew, that's that's a warning sign, alert, alert. Christian, enter in, go in with the gospel, go in with the truth of Christ, go in with the only hope of salvation. Is it hard? Yeah. Is it uncomfortable? Yeah. Will it be well received? Maybe not. But who's going to tell them the truth? Who? If not us, who? This pathway leads to destruction. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We have to be the people who love people enough to tell them the truth through through a tear-soaked Bible, through tears to tell them the truth, to plead with them, to love them enough to tell them the truth, to engage with them, to help them, to help discover what is at the root of the pain, the deep pain. Genital mutilation is not the answer. It never alleviates the pain. Obviously, the answer is Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the life he gives is a life more abundantly. He gives the life that the enemy is trying to destroy. And he can set us free and make us free in deed. Amen. So if you're struggling today with gender identity, with sexual identity, I do not condemn you at all. But what I do tell you is that there is hope in Christ. There, are, there is real and genuine and true freedom in Christ that is not found anywhere else at any other source. If you're struggling with those things, we love you. We care about you. We want to be a part of your life. We want to help you to show you who God created you to be, to help you live out God's design and purpose for your life, not to shun you or to condemn you, but to see God heal you. And so if you're struggling with that, talk to somebody, come to somebody in the church, come to an elder, come to a deacon, an elder's wife, a deacon's wife, to a pastor, come to somebody. Go to your youth leaders, 
We want to help you be who God created you to be. To speak the truth which will set you free. Father, we thank you for your word. It is that lamp unto our feet and light unto our path. Lord, help us as believers, though the world has gone crazy, to stand for the truth, to not bend, to not bow, to not give an inch. Lord, these are confusing times and often we don't know what to do in the moment. But you have given us your spirit. So Lord, teach us to hear that still small voice as we interact with coworkers and friends and family that, that may be saying these things that are not true. Let us not remain silent, but through the power of your spirit, Lord, that you would give us the words to speak as your word promises that you will do. And then help us to have the confidence in the boldness to be able to speak it. Lord, not with condemnation in our voice, not with judgment, but to share the gospel of grace, the gospel that sets us free in love. Lord, I pray that you would break our hearts for those who are experiencing so much pain and anguish of soul that they truly believe that the answer is to sever their own body parts. Lord, that, that we would not look down upon these people with pride or arrogance or judgment, but we would see them as you see them as broken people just like us who need a Savior just like us. We thank you for the hope that we have in the power of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.